Corey, thanks so much. It's a really great privilege here, and it's also been a great privilege for me. When I started out working in lung cancer, it was close to 40 years ago, and there were virtually no folks doing serious research in lung cancer, very few. And to see folks like Corey and Greg Riley, who've come along, the, they were the young folks. Greg wasn't even out of high school back then, but uh, they were the young folks, and to see them now become the senior thought leaders in lung cancer is, is fabulous, because there weren't many people working in it long when I started out. Uh, these are my disclosures. So cancer cachexia is something that's very, very common, not, not just in lung cancer, but in many cancers, but it's more common in some cancers than others, and lung cancer would be one of those. Uh, it's characterized by decreased appetite and food intake, loss of body weight, but the key thing is loss of lean body weight, loss of muscle mass. For years, I, we kind of got interested in this about four or five years ago. The, the diagnosis was kind of staring me in the face. I had a lot of kind of but were big, fairly big, burly guys saying, Doc, I don't know what happened. My arms are gone, my legs are gone. Yeah, their muscle mass was just melting away. So uh, one of the earliest studies to point this out was uh, 35 years ago, Dr. DeWeiss, uh, in ECOG looked across multiple disease types in over 3,000 patients, and he found the patients that had lost weight, they had a significantly worse prognosis, and they were associated with bad performance status, increasing number of metastatic sites, or increasing tumor burden, and, um, and they did worse. So the, uh, there's a group that's been working on cancer cachexia for a long time, Ken Ferron, see, oops, let me go back here a second. So Ken Farron has been one of those leaders. He's a surgeon from Scotland, Vicki Barakos, who's a PhD in nutrition up in Alberta. They've been leaders in this field. They've been working in, on this, in this area for decades. And they came up, and their colleagues came up with a, di a definition, which is loss of skeletal muscle mass is the key thing. And it cannot be reversed by conventional nutritional support. And one of the things we would talk about the supportive care that I think we deal with every day Patient comes in with lung cancer, they're losing weight, they're with their wife and maybe their kids, and they're saying, he won't eat, you can't get him to eat. And the poor guy can't eat, it's physical, and they're just adding, I believe, to his uh, distress by trying, they're trying to help him, but they're adding to his distress. So one of the conversations is, you know what? Try to eat small feedings more often. Don't eat the things you can't eat. If the only stuff you can eat is ice cream, eat it. So, the, but the point is, we, I know that all of us who take care of lung cancer patients, see this on a weekly basis. Now, I mentioned about skeletal muscle index, and there are ways to measure it. You can do it with a DEXA scan, but one of the ways, and this has been pioneered by Dr. Barakos up in Alberta, is to actually look at the cross-sectional muscle uh, mass of patients, and the thing, the level that she picked was the third lumbar vertebrae. Now, when we do chest CT scans, we only go down through about L1. And you have to have a special software to do this. Yeah, it's called Slice-O-Matic. But with that software, you can measure the cross-sectional muscle mass, and that divided by the height in meters squared gives us a, 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 a parameter we call skeletal muscle index. And if you look at these, here's somebody, the red is the skeletal muscle here. That's a very large amount of muscle in that first individual, less in the middle, and then a very small amount, actually sarcopenia on the far right-hand side in a man. And men and women are obviously different. Men have more muscle than women. So here's a woman with 34, that's good, 25, starting to get down, and then this is sarcopenia at the end there. So these are things that, you know, it's possible if this methodology could be incorporated and done more easily. It's not something a radiologist can be able to do on a routine basis now, but maybe with more time, this will be added and might even be part of the way we look at these patients. And we use performance status now, and, try, and obviously it's fairly good, but maybe actually looking at a person's lean body mass might give us a better idea about how well they're going to do. In fact, with Beth talked about how many of these people are going to die with one year. I'm guessing if you see people at the end over here, that's going to be a high percentage of those patients, and those who don't are going to be at this end. So the cachexia syndrome is a very complex interaction, and uh, it, they're basically... Uh, tumor-associated, whoops, I'm going to keep hitting the wrong one here, tumor-associated uh, factors, cytokines, inflammatory cells making cytokines, and uh, this leads to a decreased appetite, 
It, 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 so increase, decrease energy intake, not taking as much food in. Weakness, so they're not up and around. That leads to muscle loss too. If we have the flu and we go to bed for a few days, you get up, ooh, hey, I'm not gonna go out and run three miles today. And all of these things interact and, and lead to the cachexia thing. And again, the real driver that most of the people work in this area think is infl inflammation, inflammatory cytokines, both from uh, inflammatory cells and also probably from the tumor, also interactions with the uh, tumor stroma. And so how can we come up with ways to target this and reverse this process to help patients feel better? And possibly if we can reverse and control this process, could we, might, might we even be able to improve their outcome? Might we even be able to improve their survival? Well, this is a complicated slide, again, from somebody who's done a lot of work, Dr. Aguilis in Barcelona, has been looking at the interaction. And again, we, we kind of, the concept we, we think of, and this, I, I tried to figure a way to say it, I read an article the other day that I thought captured it. Uh, they call it cancer cell intrinsic. It's the type of thing Dr. Riley was talking about uh, earlier today, and Dr. Ross, the, you know, the mutations. So this, these are cancer cell intrinsic, but there's lots of cancer cell extrinsic processes, and here are some of them. So we have things that are acting upon the muscle, and actually the skeletal muscle is the largest organ in our body, if you consider it as one organ. That's the largest organ in our body. And it's a source not only to help us move, but it's a source of energy too. When that's broken down, it provides uh, amino acids, which when they travel to the liver, can be converted to sugar in a process we all learned way back in biochemistry, gluconeogenesis. So a lot of sugar is made. So hence the patients that say, gee, if I eat no sugar, the tumors love sugar, I can starve the tumor by not eating sugar, no the tumor is gonna starve you because it's gonna break down your muscle and it's gonna get the sugar anyway. So gluconeogenesis, and then in the tumor cell, we have altered metabolism. We have the Warburg effect, which is basically they metabolize sugar as if they were in an anaerobic condition, even though they're in an aerobic condition. It, and when you first look at it, it seems crazy because they make aerobically, when you oxidize the sugar molecule, you can make 36 ATP molecules. That's a lot of energy molecules. If you do it in a glycolytic way, you only make two, 20-fold difference. It doesn't make any sense. But here's why it works for the cancer cell. They also have a pump that's sucking in all the sugar. Much That's the basis of the PET scan. So the patients with these very PET-avid scans sucking up a lot of sugar. And then when they break the sugar down anaerobically, the glycolytic pathway, some fragments of carbon are left behind. Those are used to build amino acids and purines and primities the building blocks of macromolecules. So the tumor is getting energy and it's getting building blocks to make the macromolecules so it can proliferate. Here's, again, I, I tried to find the actual reference. Again, this is a, if anybody wants to read about this subject, Dr. Farron has got excellent review articles and this is one of them cited here. And in there he has this figure uh, where he shows with increasing muscularity there's a lower, this is in all patients, not just cancer patients, lower all-cause uh, mortality. I don't know if this is this hypothetical thing or if it's actually based on some data that he collected, but nevertheless, this is his thought that if you have sarcopenia, you're more likely to die. And you're weak, you're fragile, you're feeble. These, the cachexia thing happens in COPD, which a lot of our patients have, it happens in chronic renal failure, it happens in rheumatoid arthritis, it happens in a lot of conditions. Well, the other thing about weight loss is uh, there's some data, not very much, but it, it's my anecdotal impression fits with these data, which is people, people have lost, cancer patients who have lost weight, if you treat them uh, with a, uh, either a chemotherapy or a target ther therapy, these in this case was 5-FU or Zolota, uh, they saw more stomatitis and more uh, anemia. They weren't big studies, but people who lost weight seem to have more side effects. And this even seems to happen with targeted therapy. Here again, a couple of small papers and showing that serafinib and afatinib, two targeted therapies, that there was more sarcopenia and, and, and patients had sarcopenia had increased side effects with those agents. So something to be alert to. It may have these measurements of sarcopenia might not only give us an idea about their prognosis, it might also tell us uh, who uh, is gonna have more side effects. Well, there are a lot of things have been tried to reverse cancer cachexia. 
we think one of them is effective cancer therapy, and I'll show you some data for that. Things that stimulate the appetite, possibly inhibition of inflammation. Now, many of us have been involved in studies with COX-2 inhibitors combined with various things, targeted agents, chemo, they were negative. But maybe, again, it's kind of like the angiogenesis story. Not everybody in the beginning of their illness is, is this gonna be a factor. Maybe it won't be for any of them, but certainly it, it may be that you have to target the patients better. And then uh, ways to inhibit tumor metabolism and then some newer approaches. Well, here's an example, and again, this was presented at the World Lung a couple years ago. A manuscript has been presented or is prepared and sent off. And it was uh, across three Eli Lilly studies. They were stage four lung cancer patients, previously untreated, got different platinum doublets. And what they found is about 18% of the people gained at least 5% or more of their baseline weight. And those who gained weight, they had a significantly better survival with a hazard ratio of about 0.59. Actually not shown here is even any weight gain, a pound or two, and you say, well, that's a daily fluctuation, was also associated with much longer survival and the same type of hazard ratio, 0 0.59, 0 0.55. And I'm thinking that probably means those patients were actually just stable and maybe stable and gaining weight at a, in the early stage, you know, in the first 12 weeks or so is indicating the patients who are going to do the best. And I think it possibly means that it's reversing the mechanisms of cachexia when you treat the cancer. The inflammation is being driven by the cancer and the cytokines that are being secreted by the cancer may be reduced and maybe that's why people can eat and gain weight. Well, a lot of things have been tried to stimulate appetite, glucocorticoids, but they have the disadvantage of it really just increases fat and edema. And, and here's, in my opinion, when people have to be like for, on prednisone for either radiation pneumonitis or COPD, the biggest side effect we see is proximal muscle weakness. They can't get up out of a chair. They have to use their arms to push on the arms of the chair to get out. Hard to go upstairs. Progestins can increase appetite. Uh, in some patients, but again, it's mostly fat and edema, and it does have the problem of thromboembolic uh, events. And cannabinoids, cannabinoids really have not really been effective. I mean, maybe won't everybody won't agree with that, but I, studies I've seen think they, they really are not effective. And this is an old, old study uh, from uh, Sweden, where they looked across many different types of cancer, and they gave the patients, and they weren't getting any anti-cancer therapy. They either got a placebo or they got indocent. And uh, they also used prednisone, but indocin was actually surprisingly better. And there was a survival advantage for the patients who got indocin versus placebo. Again, is it because it inhibited inflammatory cytokines? Is it had, did it have something to do with the immune system? We don't know. I think this is something that pro some people are thinking should be re-explored, despite the negative studies that I mentioned with the COX-2 inhibitors. Here are some of the new things that are coming out. Anobisarm is a selective androgen receptor modulator. Uh, it can put lean body mass on patients. Uh, Anti-IL-6, a major driver of inflammation, is also being tested. Antimyostatin is a, a protein that actually causes muscle to break down, and an antibody against that, that's being tested. And then the compound I'm gonna talk about now is anamorlin, which is a ghrelin agonist. Well, these are the slides from Dr. Jennifer Tenel, Temel. We heard of some of Jennifer's early work with uh, doing early intervention with palliative care. Well, she also has been very involved in the development of anamorlin, and this was presented at ASCO this past year and was picked as one of the best of ASCO for supportive care. And so what is ghrelin? Well, it's a small molecule, it's oral, and it is a, a ligand for the ghrelin receptor uh, in the hypothalamus. And when it binds to that, it can stimulate appetite. It also can stimulate the release of growth hormone, which is probably the reason for the increase in lean muscle mass, plus the increase up intake of, uh, of food. Well, this, there were two studies done. They were both phase three, and they were uh, anamorlin versus placebo, and it was a two to one randomization with the two patients getting anamorlin, one getting placebo. And they were international studies. They were basically the same, but they were just done in different areas of the world. And this was a study where if you had a diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer and your performance status is two, uh, you could go on the study. And uh, you could have chemo, you could have any number of lines of chemo, you could have no chemo, you could have had just radiation. And you could be taking chemo while you're on the uh, anamorlin. 
And they had two main endpoints. One was increase in lean body mass, as I mentioned before, the DEXA scan, and then hand grip strength. Could you increase your hand, hand grip strength? And they, the trials showed, both of the trials showed, there was a significant improvement in lean body mass, basically a gain of muscle, about a kilogram, 12 weeks after starting anamorelin versus placebo. But there was no difference in the hand grip strength in either of the studies. So they met one of the primary endpoints, which was the increase in lean body mass, but not the functional part. Secondary endpoints, they also saw increase in weight, actual body, just body weight. And the quality of life module developed by Dr. Sella, looking at anorexia cachexia, that module in particular, both of the studies showed patients felt better, they had a better appetite, uh, and uh, the types of things that I mentioned, your family is pressuring you to uh, eat, that, that went down in the people getting anamorelin as opposed to placebo. And in one of the studies, it also showed that fatigue was less, their energy level was better. The other study, that did not come out to be positive. These changes happen quick, quickly. Here, here is Romana 1, Romana 2. You can see at three weeks, they're already starting to see the weight go up. It happened quickly. And same thing uh, for the symptoms of cachexia, using the quality of life questionnaires. They were at already at week three, you're starting to see I'm both green, and I keep hitting both green ones, sorry. Uh, anyways, that went up very quickly too. So the appetite went up quickly, and the weight went up quickly. It didn't have many side effects. Uh, it does cause some mild hyperglycemia. It was not a major problem. Uh, but in general, the side effects from this were really quite, quite minimal. Survival, no difference. We see that there is the two survival curves. Again, patients treated for three months, so would you expect that to have an effect on survival if this is going to work? Now, how might it, how might it make survival longer? Well, if it prevents muscle breakdown and it prevents a bigger supply of glucose to the tumor and building blocks for the macromolecules, could it possibly improve survival by retarding, not killing tumor cells, but retarding their growth rate. Don't know, I think these are things that need to be looked at in the future with more differently designed studies. So in conclusion, anorexia cachexia occurs frequently in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. It's just, we, there's preliminary or small bits and pieces of evidence that it's associated with more toxicity. In my own anecdotal experience, I absolutely think it's associated with more toxicity. The main feature of anorexia cachexia is loss of lean body mass. An anamorelin and an obisarm, the selective androgen receptor modulator, both increase lean body mass. Uh, neither improve functional status, or what was picked for one study was climbing upstairs, and anamorelin was hand grip strength. And, but anamorelin also reduced anorexia, patients who were able to eat better. Thank you very much.